This guy here is Ray Dalio. He's probably one of the most famous people in the investing world. He's also one of the richest people in the world with a fortune estimated around $15 billion. He founded what went on to be the largest hedge fund in the world, Bridgewater Associates, which currently manages $140 billion for institutional investors that include central banks, governments, and pension funds. Dalio is responsible for creating a number of portfolios throughout his career using the large amounts of data, taking into account macro information like interest rates and inflation, as well as prices of commodities, things like oil and lumber. And then based on the output of all that information, Dalio and his team pioneered portfolio management largely driven via computer algorithms. Those computers doing the trading ended up making better decisions than any other humans could make, especially amongst their competitors who fell short with their investments back during the dot-com bubble and the financial crash. Dalio's flagship fund called Pure Alpha One actually made money during the financial crash of 2008, returning to investors 8.5% when the rest of the market was on fire. That year, the S&P 500 returned a loss of 37%, leaving Ray and his team to take the glory and get floods of new money coming in, cementing their place in the investing hall of fame. That's if one of those places actually existed, but anyway, you get the point. Along the way, another fund that Ray Dalio made popular was called the All Weather Fund. Now, this portfolio is designed to help investors get through what Dalio calls the four different seasons of the economy. Firstly, periods of high inflation, just like what we're experiencing right now with the price of goods and services shooting up to those levels we haven't seen before. Next, the opposite of this, periods of very low inflation, where the price of goods and services remains low and doesn't increase in price very much. Thirdly, periods of high growth in the economy, which you could say we've just witnessed in 2020 and 2021. And then finally, periods of low growth in the markets where we don't get that exciting double digit returns anymore and stock prices remain sluggish and stubborn. Who knows what we might get soon. The portfolio is designed so that the components of it balance each other out and contrast each other to the extent that when one part might rise, another may fall in value, meaning that they are negatively correlated. For example, if equities are performing poorly, that's the performance of companies in the stock market, then on the other side, we might see bonds performing slightly better. This is because bonds, especially those issued by governments, have a predictable income and are almost no risk to investors. So this helps balance out the portfolio so investors can hopefully ride out any storm. What does it actually look like then? Let's have a peek inside and we'll run through each of the holdings, break them down one by one, and then we'll also look at how we might be able to build it and who this portfolio might actually be for. The portfolio is broken down into five parts. We've got stocks, different length bonds, commodities, and gold too. Starting with stocks, this portfolio is made up from 30% of equities, specifically we're talking about US companies. This means that investors will benefit from any growth in the largest market in the world, which includes some of the largest and most profitable companies, including the likes of Apple, Microsoft, Google and Tesla. Up next we've got bonds, more specifically US treasuries, and these actually make up the largest part of this portfolio. The treasuries are broken down into two distinct categories, that's long term and intermediate term. Long-term treasuries make up 40% of the portfolio and the intermediate length ones make up 15%. That's a total of 55% to bonds, which is nearly twice as much in comparison to the stocks. Now, what this means is that the portfolio is going to be a lot more defensive compared to the overall market. Although, if you need to protect your wealth rather than expose it to significant risks, it could be an interesting balance. Now we've got the final parts, an equal 7.5% split between commodities and gold. Commodities here would include anything like oil and lumber, which we've seen all massive price increases recently as inflation's taking hold of the economy since the pandemic started. Just take a look at the increase in the price of oil, which has virtually doubled in cost over the past couple of years. Gold, finally then, is our hedge against inflation, one of the most well-established and trustworthy stores of value known to man. The concept of using gold is that during periods of excessive monetary policy or even high inflation, gold retains its value better than holding your capital in cash. However, let's not forget that this asset is still in the mercy of the market and it's not always been a smooth ride. Over the performance of the last 20 years and during the last few years, things have been quite unpredictable, especially if you've invested in gold back in, say, 2012. You've had to go through more than a period of a decade to break even on those investments when the equities market's been red hot. Before talking about who this portfolio might be for and how we can build it, let's quickly take a look at its performance and get to the market. If we head back until 2006, here's how the funds performed against the trusty S&P 500. Overall in this example, the $10,000 investment was much better off in the S&P 500 at least until today, returning over $42,000.
and that's compared with the All Weather portfolio which delivered just over $30,000. However, this is really not a fair comparison and doesn't reflect what the fund is really trying to achieve. So we need to look a little closer at the results than just those end figures. Looking closer, here are the parts that matter. Firstly, look at how much each portfolio performs during both good and bad times. Check out the numbers here on the worst year and the maximum drawdowns, which shows the worst possible dip in the investment. The S&P 500, although performing better overall, is a lot more volatile when compared to the all-weather portfolio. Its worst year was 37% down and its maximum drawdown was over 50%. Imagine trying to stomach that. In the current market, we could be headed in that direction. Who knows? Now, compare this to the all-weather portfolio. There's a lot more stability here. Its worst year was only a loss of 4.5% and its worst ever drawdown was only 11.98% into the red. I'm sure you'll agree that you'd be a lot happier if you saw those numbers than losing half of your investments in the wider market. Another thing to note which shows the power of the all-weather portfolio is the market correlation. Know how the S&P 500 measures the level of one, which is the standard position and we would expect that seeing as the S&P 500 is a good measure of the market. Now, look at the all-weather portfolio. This has a measure of 0.45. In short, this means that for every 1% the market goes up or down, the all-weather portfolio is typically going to move less than half of that, which works both in the good times and the bad times, as it will reduce the losses, but it will also reduce those returns as well on the upside. For example, if the S&P 500 made a 10% gain in one year, the all-weather portfolio might move approximately 4.5%, but of course, it's never an exact science, it's just what you might expect. With all that said, how can we make this? I'll provide you a couple of options here using low-cost exchange traded funds. I'll give you an option if you live in the US and if you live in the UK because I'm just so kind like that. For the US All Weather Fund, here's what you're going to need. I'll leave those on screen for you now when a huge credit goes to John Williamson at OptimizePortfolio.com for putting all of this together. He wrote an excellent piece about using leverage in this fund too to make things even more interesting. Now for us UK folk, we have to work a little harder as we can only purchase USITS ETFs those that are created to the standards that our laws expect. For a UK equivalent, here's what I've put together. Remember that I'm in no way a professional financial advisor, I'm just someone who enjoys doing this and makes YouTube videos about finance, so please make sure you do all of your own research and seek help if you need it. If you've enjoyed the video so far and want more finance content, please do me a massive favour and invest gently into that like button by turning it blue. Also consider adding a comment below, otherwise the spammers end up taking over the comment section and writing all kinds of weird stuff. I really hope they fix that one day, but anyway, Let's get back to the video. Knowing all of this, who's this fun for? Well, there's two answers here and I'd also love your thoughts too. Firstly, many institutional clients would prefer a portfolio like this, so they've got a much more stable and well-diversified investment. Imagine if you're a university pension fund or even a government, there's no way that you'd expose yourself 100% to the stock market and ignore all those other asset classes like bonds, commodities and gold. Your goal isn't necessarily to get maximum growth, but to maintain and preserve your wealth and also pay out people as they retire, even during market downturns. You have to sacrifice some of the upside for the reduced downside risk, which is a reasonable trade-off. On the other hand, the other person who I might think this could be for is someone near or in retirement age. Again, like the institutional investors, you'll be wanting to protect your wealth and preserving all of those hard-earned gains that you'd made during the years of capital growth when you were working. You still want to have some growth in the stock market and own a small slice of some of the world's largest companies, but you need to generate some income through either selling your investments or through those bonds. For me personally, this sort of investment doesn't really interest me just yet and I'll be sticking with 100% of my investments in equities and other kinds of investments that carry a lot more risk but offer those greater rewards, especially in the longer term. As a bonus suggestion, for those of you still here in the video, you could look at replacing commodities in the portfolio with utilities. These things like gas, water and electricity companies. I can't take credit for this one. Again, this one goes to John Williamson. But his point is really interesting because utilities have actually performed really well because there are staple requirements and regardless of economic conditions, I think we'll pretty much always need water and power to at least run our lives. Also, they've got the lowest correlation to the stock market when compared to any other category, which Again, like we discussed before, helps protect you when things aren't going so well. If you've enjoyed this video, you might want to take a look at some of my other suggestions for other really popular Vanguard funds that you might want to add to your own portfolio to help grow your wealth in the long term. Or if you've already watched that one, then why not check out this other video and enjoy the ride. Anyway, thanks again for watching. Please drop me a big like, write me a comment below and feel free to subscribe for much more content. I'll see you in the next video and as always, happy investing.